Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from YourBlackWorld.com, and uh, I was thinking today about the concept of black pride and uh, self-reliance and, you know, what it means to feel good about being black and whether or not uh, black pride or black self-reliance automatically means that you don't like white people. Um, and I know that most of us know that that's not the case, but you know of people, you probably know of some people who feel that that, that is the case. Um, and so to talk about this issue, I wanted to bring on my partner in crime, my editor-in-chief at Your Black World, Ms. Yvette Cardell. How are you doing today, Yvette? Pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm driving through Ohio right now. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yes, I'm driving through Ohio. There's lots of cornfields and tornadoes and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, I, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I was driving through Ohio, and, and I love my long drives because it gives me a chance to kind of think about things. And, and I was thinking today about uh, something that happened this week that a lot of people know about, which is that um, that the events that I'm holding at the end of the month uh, are form on wealth, education, family, and community uh, with Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, it was rejected by the University of Illinois Chicago, um, and uh, we were kind of surprised because we there were there were several places that were interested in hosting the event, but they seemed particularly eager to do it, um, and so we agreed to to do it because we love the venue, and so we started making plans and pushing out the the message to people, and we were getting hundreds of people that were that have RSVP'd for the event, and the, then the show will go on, but then out of the blue, they just hit us up and said we're dropping the event. And I and so um I talked to my business manager about it and I said, Well what happened? And so effectively, effectively um there's an issue apparently with Minister Farrakhan. And I was sort of taken aback, like, okay, what's the issue? I know that there are people out here that don't like Farrakhan uh, as much as I do. But, you know, I said, is, is it because you do you think I mean, did we not tell you that we were bringing Minister Farrakhan? Uh, you know, did we uh not tell you that the event was going to be about black people. I mean, usually when you hear my, you know, you hear me talk and you hear Farrakhan talk, we're talking about black people. And uh, apparently what I gathered is that there was some student backlash from people who feel that Minister Farrakhan doesn't like white people, and that he, he, he doesn't like Jewish people. And, you know, I find that really interesting. You know, when I sat with the minister and I sat with them for nine hours when we were at Phoenix, three hours, actually, just a month earlier uh, in private in, uh, in Chicago. And during that time, he talked about uh, some of these anti-Semitism uh, allegations. And, um, you know, I, I just don't see it. You know, I, I, I know that he has a good relationship with the Jewish community in Chicago. There are lots of people in that community that have a lot of respect for him. And also, he's almost 80 years old. And it's really interesting to me that when people attack him for being anti-Semitic, they're usually grabbing a quote or two from 30 years ago. And even then, when you read the quotes, um, you know, it, I, I don't really see the kind of anti-Semitism that you might have seen in Nazi Germany or something like that. I, I just see a man who, who feels strongly that there are people in certain positions of power that are oppressing black people, and that many of them are Jewish. And there's evidence to that effect. And so I was curious to ask you, you know, do you, what do you think it is, that, that leads uh, white folks to react the way they do to Minister Farrakhan when they see him. Well, I, I think what I think the reaction to Minister Farrakhan is is, is the reaction that a lot of uh, you know when you a lot of people in the dominant culture have to any black person who decides to kind of go out of the box in a way that's deemed radical. You know, there are like two lanes in America. You have a little narrow Republican lane. You have a little narrow Democrat lane. That's, that's also a lane of thought. If you try to express anything outside of that thought, you're never allowed back into, you know, dominant mainstream culture. The thing is part of that's part of the punishment of, you know, trying to think outside the box or empowering the people in a way that other people may not deem appropriate. You know, I may not agree with everything Farrakhan says and I don't, but I think he has a right to express that. You know, it's funny to me that that, that Pat Robertson has a seven hundred club show. After he's demeaned, you know, he's demeaned, you know, he's been homophobic, he's been anti-black, he's been anti-everything you can be, you know. But, but you know, people just kind of say, well, you know, he's old, you know, and these, well, these things happen, and, you know, but he still has his show, he still has his platform, and he can go wherever he wants to go. So 
there may be protests, but even if there are protests for Pat Robinson, that's because Pat Robinson has said things that are far more inflammatory than anything Farrakhan has ever said. So I think if, if you're a black person, you know, if you're a white person and you say something that's inflammatory, you're either old or you're eccentric or you're a person who thinks outside the box, you know, even if you're bigoted. But if you're a black person, you say, well, I'm, I, I may make some mistakes. I'm not always the right, but I'm really trying to do the right thing. I'm really just trying to empower my people. So give me a little leeway here. You know, the, the majority culture is like, no, we're not giving you any leeway. We're not taking into account your intent. We are going to squash you, and you will never be allowed within that. You know, you'll never be allowed within the sphere of, you know, public discourse again. You go your own way. So I think that's what's happening in the Farrakhan. Wow. Well, you know, it, it, it's really interesting um, that when you look at the people who have issues with Farrakhan, uh, when you talk to, you know, mostly white folks who don't like him, or even, even some black folks too, most of these people who don't like him or who think that he – is uh, is this evil person. Uh, Most of these people have never heard Farrakhan speak. Uh, And I find it interesting that people can speak so strongly about something that they know nothing about. I remember uh, having a conversation right after the Million Man March with a white woman who was actually a really good friend of mine at the time. And I I said, uh, I'm really excited about what I saw at the Million Man March, and Minister Farrakhan did an amazing job. And she said, yeah, I know about Farrakhan. He's an idiot. And I said, well, have you heard him speak? And she said, no, but I know he's an idiot. I said, well, how do you know he's an idiot? She said, I don't know. I just know he's an idiot. So how can you know something that you just said you don't know? So to me, it's 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 interesting that a, a lot of black leaders are defined by these 20, 30-second sound bites on Fox News. And we know who controls the media. It's not black folks. So most of the time, and I, I, I tell this to people all the time, every time they – they want to attack the Jesses and the Al's and other people like that, which they deserve some criticism because even I've had some things to say. But I tell them, I say, look, do you notice how every single prominent black leader who stands up against the power structure on, on any level in his own way is usually made out to be a buffoon or a lunatic? That's not by accident. All these people are not lunatics. I, I've sat with these individuals, and I, I remember – I, can, I have to get this to Reverend Sharp. We don't agree on Obama. That's why we don't really talk anymore. Uh, and, he, and, and I think he knows how I feel about that. But there have been fewer conversations in my life that have impacted me more than sitting there and listening to Reverend Sharp for four or five hours at a time. The man is as brilliant as any college professor I have ever seen in my life. And so I think that we have to start learning how to evaluate our own public figures in our own way without allowing other people to tell us what they are and who they are. And here's another interesting thing. I don't know if you knew this event, but did you know that the Southern Poverty Law Center actually identifies the Nation of Islam as a hate group? Did you know that? I I did know that. Yes, I did know that. So we said, what do you think would lead the Southern Poverty Law Center, an organization that, uh, that many of us as black people feel works on our behalf, to conclude that the nation of Islam could be defined as hateful. Well, you, you know, I don't, I don't understand why it's defined as a hate group. But I, I will, I will say this: I have, I have, uh, you know, in terms of the, the nation of Islam, um, it's not just one sided with me. You know, on a certain, on, there's a part of me that that, that remembers. The, the the million man march and remembers you know how how you know how happy and how you know how how excited black men were you know that day that they were getting together they were going to be there with their brothers and they you know the pride of that whole thing and then there's another part of me that understands also that kind of what Farrakhan's Nation of Islam Church preaches is is is, is in my mind at least sort of patriarchal you know sometimes homophobic you know but when I think of that. I don't want that in terms of what I want in terms of my black America. But I understand that there's also there's also a white America, there's also a white right wing that preaches the same thing but is widely accepted and isn't a pariah in society. Um, so the question that I have to ask is why are these two groups being treated so differently? You know, people are very quick to call to call Farrakhan a bigot for something that he said, you know, you know, twenty years ago. But People aren't nearly as quick to call someone a big, you know, at CPAC who just said something this week. You know, so that that's the question for me. The question for me is is why do we have these very different standards? And honestly, when you look at Farrakhan, even when even when you look at what he is doing and what I think he is doing wrong, 
you still get to feel that it's coming out of a good place, you know, and that he's growing as a human being. So I don't, I don't know how you could take all of that and and pack it up into into and, and say that this guy, you know, is leading a, a hate organization that wants to hurt people. I've I've never, you know, I've heard I've heard of quite a few of Farrakhan's speeches, and I've heard him talk about self defense in much the same way that the Black Panther talks about self defense. But I haven't heard him saying that he wants to go out and hurt people. That 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 should be that that should be a path that black people should engage on. But you have to remember, the Black Panthers weren't trying to necessarily hurt people. They were really trying to defend black people. They 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 brought up you know picking up your guns as a way to defend your community. But they were maligned as terrorists as well. So you have these very different standards in terms of how black people are treated and how white people are treated in this, in, when they when they make very similar you know statements. Well, well, I can I can tell you this, Yvette. Um, I think that if you if you're going to define the nation of Islam as a hate group, then you should certainly define Fox News as a hate group. If you look at how much racial animosity that they have created through distorted uh, pers- perspectives on people of color, uh, there, there's no match for the, the damage that they have done. They have destroyed lives. They have done so many things that have that have led to, uh, to to those crazy people who watch that network doing things to hurt people of color, you know, it, subtly and not so subtly. I, I you know, I, I think that it's, it's it's astonishing to me that uh, that that the Southern Poverty Law Center would say this, but at the same time, it's not that surprising in light of the fact that uh, that there's a reason why America should have a concern about a, a person like Farrakhan. Um, the reason they should be concerned is because the message of self-reliance is very threatening to the American power structure. I, I don't think anybody – I think in stomach can tolerate integration because integration sort of means, okay, you can come in and be one of us. That means we have more consumers to sell our products to. We have more workers to work in our factories. We, you know, and, and we, can, we can sort of wash away the guilt that we feel for enslaving you, but we're not going to give you that much power. We still – own the house, and you can't. You're not going to move in our house and move around the furniture because it's our house. So we'll allow you to integrate, but we're going to negotiate the terms of your integration. It's almost like me deciding to give up your black world and going to work for a company, and the company saying, "Well, we'll integrate you, but we're not going to let you have any power. We don't want you to own anything, boys. We we want to own you. We'll pay. We'll, we might even pay you a decent salary, or we might not. But but we define the terms, and you have no power. Well, it, that's not an adequate integration. That's like a bad marriage. And that's what black America su- has suffered through over the last 30 or 40 years. As, as brilliant as what Dr. King uh, did, uh, you know, as brilliant as his work was before he died, I think that it, right before he died was when he was really starting to get his momentum to actually talk about economic equality and also various forms of economic empowerment within the black community because in a capitalist society, if you don't have wealth, you don't have anything. And the thing that the Minister Farrakhan have, and I have spoken about uh, for hours over the last three months is the idea of finding models that will allow for black economic self-sufficiency. And that is what we were going to gather to discuss in Chicago. And we're still going to, to have to gather. The show will still go on. We've got almost a 1,000 people now that, have, that are coming out. Uh, but so I think that this idea of us truly find its self-sufficiency, it's almost like a, a rocket ship trying to get out of the Earth's atmosphere. You know, the first, you know, few thousand miles up or a few thousand feet up, you're not going to have much resistance because you're still within the gravitational pull of the Earth. But when you hit that outer layer between the, the Earth's atmosphere and outer space, there's a lot of resistance. Your, your ship might blow up. <laughs> you have to be determined to know where you want to go. And once you break out of that, then you can be free. And I think that for us as black people, that, that economic empowerment is that last area of extreme resistance that we're going to get. This is not something that people are going to give us. Nobody to, to, to truly expect somebody to just give you equality and to give you power, that's like being in a basketball game and, and, and asking the other team to give you enough points to help you win the game. They might give you enough points to help you uh, lose by 20 instead of losing by 50, they might give you those 30 points because you still have lost. But if you're really trying to win the game, you have to score those points yourself. 
So I think that the idea of doing things for ourselves is very important. I think that that concept is very threatening because white supremacy teaches people to believe that when I tell you that I'm rejecting this relationship, you somehow interpret that to mean that I am rejecting you. And the fact is that, that I, there's nobody, you know, nobody I speak with who walks around talking about how much we hate white people. No. But we hate anybody that hurts our family. We, we're not going to let anybody destroy our community. We're not going to let anybody walk all over us. And, 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 and that's just something that I think any decent self-respecting human being is going to believe. And so I'm going to let you get the last word that uh, I've said the most. Uh, you know, what do you think in, in terms of, you know, where black people are and, and where we need to go in order to achieve some degree of self-sufficiency, which I think is real. Right, what do you think about, about the what, so I think Farrakhan yeah. I I I and Sadie, they spoke about, you know, um, the need to, 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 to save money, you know, basically not spending everything you get and, 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 and buy something meaningful. And one of the things that's meaningful right now is land to make some, you know, purchases, you know, that actually have value. But I think when I think of, when I think of Farrakhan, you know, the person who comes to mind on the other side of the aisle, you know, is a person who I had a lot of conversations about in the run-up to the 2000, you know, 2012 election you know, with Ron Paul. And I remember talking about, you know, Ron Paul to, to, to my black friends, and my black friends would say, oh, you know, he's just an old racist, blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, that's, he, he probably is. Maybe he is, but that's fine. That doesn't mean that he's wrong in terms of mass incarceration. That doesn't mean that he's wrong in term of, terms of drones. 